world to come will be different from our expectations. Let me share with you some systems perspective and anecdote. One morning, two young fish were playing off a coral reef when an old fish passed by saying, good morning, fellows, how is the temperature of the water? The young fish stopped playing. One asked the other, what did he say? He asked how the temperature of the water was, the other said. Whereupon the first fish asked, what is water? Water is all-encompassing and life essential to fish, but they're not aware of it. Surplus energy is to modern-day humanity what water is to fish. We too are not aware of it. And yet, energy and materials are the very foundation of today's society. When human cultures were powered by muscle, biomass, and primitive ways of capturing daily flows of energy from solar wind, humans were very aware of the limited quantity and intermittent quality of energy. Until in the early 19th century, when humans discovered how to extract stocks of stored and compacted ancient sunlight in the form of hydrocarbons and other mineral materials from under Earth's surface to boost their economies. When combined with a machine, a few liters of fuel could do the same work in a few minutes as a person laboring for an entire month. The sudden access to the stored photosynthesis turbocharged our populations, access to goods, services, and technology. And in the course of the 20th century, with this new power source, compared to a global labor force of around 5 billion real humans, the machines and work powered by hydrocarbon energy added the equivalent power of 500 billion human workers in the form of energy slaves. During this carbon pulse of fossil growth and consumption, our fundamental link to nature was first neglected and then forgotten. The main inputs to our economies were now mostly free. We merely had to pay for the cost of their extraction, not the cost of their creation, their true value, nor their pollution. To our ancestors, our current energy would seem indistinguishable from magic. But instead of appreciating this giant one-time subsidy from the past, we developed stories that our newfound wealth and progress had emerged purely from human ingenuity. We had become energy blind. In imagining the future, it is important to realize that energy is a core driver of the natural world and dictates what can and cannot happen. We rarely think about it or talk about it, but we all now live during the carbon pulse, the few hundred years where humans are drawing down Earth energy battery millions of times faster than it was trickle charged by daily photosynthesis. During the past 200 years, we burned what our planet took about 200 million years to store. Now, each year we burn energy at a rate of 4.2 million years worth of fossil stocks. That is 22 times longer than our species has roamed this planet. With these energy slaves, we remodeled the physical arrangements of our cities, our economies, and our expectations of our future lifestyles. We also remodeled our economic theories. Whilst science cannot ignore any part of reality, economic scientism can. Failing to integrate externalities and lacking integrated reporting, the resulting reality blindness has caused the human predicament we are currently in. Looking at today's instrument panel of Spaceship Earth, Houston, we have a problem, is an understatement. Physics and chemistry do not support the idea of infinity on a finite planet. And yet, all this remodeling was based on the assumption that we would forever be able to rely on plentiful, cheap energy slaves. This is incompatible with a renewable power future. The biggest misconception in our bright plans for the future is to think that renewable energy will one day compare favorably to the cheap fossil fuels that have served us the last 200 years. While sun and wind are free, the minerals to capture, convert, store, and distribute them are not. Renewables is essentially a metals business. Wind blades, turbines, batteries, motors, 
power grid, etc. High quality ores and energy deposits are now mostly things of the past. Plenty remains, but it's lower quality and both more costly and ecologically destructive to access and extract them. For copper alone, we have to excavate five times more ore per ton of copper than 100 years ago. And we've only just begun with large-scale electrification. Just like cash flow is not the same as capital, harvesting energy flows is not the same as stepping into energy stocks. Pulses, by definition, don't last forever. The inconvenient truth is that renewables cannot power this society. That is why it is essential that the annual COP process that seeks to establish an adequate set of agreements to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees widens its scope to also include demand-side solutions and natural solutions on top of supply-side solutions only. Without this, its stated objective will not be attained. There is another reason why we must rein in our energy addiction. In the current upward cycle of sea level rise, as a result of reduced ice formation in the Arctic, our anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions are accelerating sea level rise, putting our coastal megacities at risk. We are in reality just seeking the same brain rewards as our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Dopamine is a molecule that in animals and in humans lead to motivation and action. In our materially consumption era, the wanting of things has become stronger than the reward we get from having them. This is a fundamental problem for an economic system that is turning billions of barrels of oil into microliters of dopamine. Humans are creatures with finite lifespans. The future is not a priority to us emotionally. Instead, we are focused on the very short term. This weekend's plan, this quarter's earnings, this term's elections. We often promise to make big changes starting tomorrow, until tomorrow becomes today and the cycle repeats, delaying any actual change. We are mildly intelligent but highly social apes. Most people believe that money is real wealth. Yet everything we spend money on requires energy to mine, create, deliver, run, maintain, and dispose of. In this way, money is ultimately a direct claim on energy and resources. Our economic stories assert that with more money, we can create more of anything. The truth is we cannot create energy, which is the true foundation of our monetary systems. As we create more money, we do not create more resources. We merely can access, extract, and burn them faster. The highest sustained economic growth peaked 50 years ago when oil production growth was at what is highest. But rather than living within our means, we found creative ways to extend growth for a while longer. We created complex supply chains, outsourced the heavy lifting to cheaper labor countries, and in addition to the subsidy from the past, we added a subsidy from the future. Credit. Thus, we are now burning the candle on both ends. That allows us to spend resources from the future and call it economic growth. This phenomenon has become so pervasive in the last 50 years that we think it's normal to consume today and pay tomorrow. The way we've been living is an anomaly, but we take it for granted because as individuals, it's all we've ever known. We have rich, creative, and colorful imaginations that reside in the virtual worlds of our minds. The human brain can imagine and verbalize limitless combinations of physical impossibilities. Sustainable outposts on Mars, self-perpetuating energy machines, and an economy based on physical consumption growing continually for centuries. In ancestral times, these virtual worlds overlapped with the physical worlds we inhabited keeping us grounded in reality. But in a culture of vast material wealth, information overload, and social media, it's increasingly difficult for us to separate fantasy from reality. When our individual virtual worlds connect, the result is a widespread shared belief that our current wealth is due mostly to our cleverness and that technology will continue limitless growth. 
everything we're used to in society will become more costly or less available. We're not planning for this because it's never happened before. The onset of the great simplification will be financial and economic turbulence, followed by contraction as economies will recede to a scale that can again be supported by physical flows without credit. The ensuing simplification will be among the most significant events ever experienced by our species. We need to think systemically, critical, logical and holistic. Those who look through a systems lens can serve as early visionaries of a simpler life, with new ways of relating to technology, to consumption, to each other and to Earth ecosystems. This year is the 50th anniversary of the Club of Rome's Limits to Growth report. Rerun on a 21st century supercomputer gave this startling graphic, with the actuals tracking pretty much along the forecast lines. In the roaring 20s we're now in, many tipping points are coming together. There are many simplification pathways. Some are wise, humane and even preferable to what we have. Some are so dark as to be nearly unthinkable. Yet it is precisely thinking about these pathways and actively choosing among them which offers the only realistic hope for a long and meaningful human future. Being familiar with scenario thinking is an advantage. The world to come will be different from our expectations. After two, three hundred thousand years, we humans could have a bright future lasting millions more years. Dinosaurs were here for 80 million years. But we need to understand the ecology, biology and physics to know which paths remain open to us and which lead to dead ends. Nature has gifted us with a productive and beautiful home, the ability to understand how we got here and the creativity to imagine which paths are possible. The future need not be dystopian, but cleverness alone will no longer do for the next leg of our journey. We will need imagination, foresight, empathy and above all wisdom to survive the next 200 years first, preferably in a civilized and peaceful way. As you imagine the future, do make sure physics and chemistry agree, because the future will be real, and most likely it will be simpler and based on flows again.